Thank you for joining us for CBN News. Watch MF from Graham ahead today. Chaos continues on Capitol Hill. The House is not in session because Congress can't do any business until Republicans elect a speaker. And so far, they haven't been able to do it, with GOP leader Kevin McCarthy repeatedly failing to get enough votes. The root issue is this. They do not trust Kevin McCarthy. What can heal that divide? So what do Republicans do now? Some hopeful news for NFL player DeMar Hamlin as his recovery is moving in a positive direction after he collapsed on the field on national television Monday night. How the Biden administration is moving to make it easier to get the abortion pill. Now pharmacies can offer them and they can be bought through the mail, even in states where they're illegal. Iran says it's ready to make a new nuclear deal, but an expert tells CBN News why Iran's government cannot be trusted. This is a case of Europe and the United States finally realizing that the emperor has no clothes in Iran. Threats to America's national security under the sea. Critical fiber optic cables that carry worldwide internet traffic. Anytime an economy is so dependent on, on um, infrastructure or a particular sector, uh, it becomes strategic, right? It becomes, it becomes a point of vulnerability. <laughs> so our adversaries and competitors recognize this. Is anything being done to protect these critical information lines? And a famous biblical location will soon be open to the public after 2,000 years. Those stories and more today on CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin this half hour in Washington. Where Republicans in the House are at a crossroads as Ke leader Kevin McCarthy has repeatedly failed to win enough votes to become speaker. Even so, McCarthy remains determined to push ahead as he tries to win over the Republicans who oppose him. Former President Donald Trump urged Republicans to support McCarthy, but that was not enough. Having my favorite president call us and tell us we need to knock this off. I think it actually needs to be reversed. The president needs to tell Kevin McCarthy that, sir, you do not have the votes and it's time to withdraw. The root issue is this. They do not trust Kevin McCarthy. What can heal that divide? Well, I think that uh, the, the more times he has a vote and does not win, uh, the more times it shows that there's uh, a lack of confidence in, in part of the conference with, with his leadership. McCarthy says progress is being made, but he's facing growing pressure to find the votes he needs to force to step aside. So far, roughly 20 conservative holdouts have not budged in their position. One key issue for some Republicans, stopping out of control government spending. NFL player DeMar Hamlin appears to be making some progress after the Buffalo Bills defensive back suffered a cardiac arrest during the Monday night football game in Cincinnati. Hamlin's recovery from cardiac arrest continues moving in a positive direction. That is according to his marketing representative, Jordan Rooney. He told the Associated Press, we all remain optimistic, adding Hamlin's family asked not to go into further detail. The Bills said Hamlin was still in critical condition but displayed signs of improvement. They said he was expected to remain in intensive care. Millions of people have been praying for Hamlin since his injury, and his family has thanked those who have offered their prayers and support. Months after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, the Biden administration is paving the way for easier access to abortion. Just this week, the FDA finalized a rule allowing pharmacies to offer abortion pills, and the Justice Department said the Postal Service can deliver the pills even in states that ban them. Heather Sells brings us the story. The FDA's new rule lets pharmacies like Walgreens and CVS sell abortion pills as long as they receive a government certification. Pro-life leaders say that is bad news for women. This is a very reckless decision. It was not made with women's health or safety in mind. More than half of the women in the U.S. who choose abortion use the pills, according to the Guttmacher Institute. The FDA maintains that they're safe if used as directed. Still, women who use the pills risk complications, including hemorrhaging, infection, retaining fetal tissue and cervical damage. One six-year study says abortion pills are four times more dangerous than surgical abortion. Pro-life pregnancy centers say they hear from women using the pills 
in trouble and unsure what to do. We've already been getting the phone calls from women who have uh, actively aborted uh, their own child at home, uh, where they literally are looking at their aborted child in their palm of their hand and, and calling us and asking, what do I do now? Still, the Biden administration is moving on multiple fronts to allow greater access to the pills. This week, the Justice Department made clear the Postal Service can deliver the pills, even in states that ban them. Its reason, the pills can also be used to manage miscarriages, so they can't be sure they'll be used for abortions. We're recommending that all states, red or blue, uh, track um, emergency room complications that, that re reporting to the state health department. The pro-life Susan B. Anthony list says states should watch for more women in emergency rooms after taking the pills. And they're calling on state pharmacy boards to oversee pharmacies that get approved to dispense them. Last year, the Biden administration rolled back the rule that women must pick up abortions in person at a medical office. This week's decision paves the way for women to get a prescription via telehealth and then receive the pills in the mail or from a pharmacy. Still, the fight is far from over. Legal experts predict court battles over access will rage for years. Heather Sells, CBN News. San Diego police are investigating a possible hate crime. Left-wing activists vandalized a church that was scheduled to hold a New Year's Eve worship service led by ministry leader Sean Foyt. Foyt posted video and photos of City View Church. Investigators say Antifa members defaced the building and caused minor damage. Phrases like queer bash queers bash back, Sean breeds hate, and no safe space for bigots were spray painted across the campus. Hundreds still attended the New Year's Eve event. Foyt posted persecuting the church will not stop the gospel. It will spark a wildfire. Coming up, the government of Iran says it is ready for a new version of the nuclear deal. But will we hear from an ex we'll hear from an expert who explains why the government cannot be trusted. We've got that story for you when we come back. Stay with us. Iran's government says it is ready to wrap up a new nuclear deal, but finalizing an agreement at this time may be a bit difficult. Appearing on this week's episode of The Global Lane, Middle East Forum Director Greg Roman says Western governments realize they cannot trust a regime that is arming Russia in Ukraine and oppressing Iranians who are demanding change. This is a case of Europe and the United States finally realizing that the emperor has no clothes in Iran especially since the Russians are now relying upon Iranian exports of drones and missile technology to hit at the joint European funded front in Ukraine, and also realizing that they have no intention of helping the Iranians get a diplomatic or any policy win, so long as their own people are calling for the overthrow of their government. The reason why I think the Russians are doubling down now is because they need a new front to try to engage Europe and the United States on, as Ukraine is not going very well for them. And they also owe their Iranian allies a little bit of a payback for what Iran has done to help the Russians try to bolster their forces in Ukraine. So if Russia and Iran are able to get back to the table, the Americans and Europeans realize that it's a loss for Europe and America if they are to acquiesce to what Iran is doing right now with Russia and Europe. Yeah, this, this seems like a new equation here because I remember George Bush used to refer, refer to it as the axis of evil, including Iran, North Korea, and so forth. Now you've got Russia in there with Iran. What are the uh, implications of that? Well, look at Russia's involvement with Iran's nuclear program, first and foremost. They've funded the building of Boucher, Iran's first nuclear reactor. They've also sent Russian technology to help with some of Iran's other nuclear uranium enrichment and other centrifuge technologies. And now it's in Russia's interest to try to keep Iran close and to help them with whatever their policy needs are, because Russia's been shut off by most of the world, including even China to a certain extent, with their ability to import technology from Beijing. So Russia wants to give Iran a pass as it relates to their nuclear technology. And they're trying to r r rattle the saber 
of Iranian arms munitions production, which will threaten other Middle Eastern countries, even though it's Russia who's paying for Iran to be able to manufacture drones and missiles, which right now are being used against Ukraine, but could ostensibly be used against Israel, Turkey, and other American Gulf allies tomorrow. So Russia's playing a double game. I think America and Europe have realized this, and they're not going to move the line towards a nuclear deal so long as Iran continues its belligerent behavior in the Middle East and continues to support Russia's offensive war against Ukraine. I'm sure many of those, even in Israel, who favor a new agreement, say Israel would benefit because the development of the Iranian nuclear program would be slowed, monitored by the UN. What do you say? I think Iran's most dramatic gains in its nuclear program were when it was a signatory to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Its ability to increase the building of infrastructure in areas like Isfahan and Shiraz, where there's uranium enrichment taking place, its ability to build its nuclear program in terms of the military capability, which was revealed by the Mossad in a daring raid where the Israeli intelligence agency was able to steal Iran's entire nuclear archive, demonstrably showing that progress on its military aspects did not stop when it signed its deal. So there may be those in favor of slowing down the Iranian nuclear project, but the offset to that is an increase in Iran's ability to, number one, first and foremost, wage war against its own citizens by having more monies come in that it can use to militarize populations that still support the regime. And number two, outside of Iran's borders, we saw an uptick in Iranian attacks against American allies in Iraq, its funding of Hezbollah in Lebanon, and its ability to bolster the Assad regime in Syria. So I think that you can have both a slowdown in the Iran nuclear project and the ability to stop funding Iranian terrorism by getting tougher with Iran and making sure that there's more demonstrable consequences leading up into a military strike against its nuclear facilities by pursuing other policy options, well, like supporting I... the revolution yeah. or by clamping down with more economic sanctions against Tehran. Do you think we're seeing the beginning of the end of the Islamic regime or is greater oppression coming? I think you have the nucleus of what could be the beginning of the end of the Islamic regime in Iran, but it will be for naught if the protesters are not able to coalesce around common leadership. The one missing ingredient right now in these 90 to 120 days of protest, depending on where you have your starting point, is, is that there is no true leadership which is exhibited them standing up to be the face of this revolution. And you can't have a faceless revolution because eventually it'll allow the current political elements to manipulate perhaps the overthrow of the Ayatollah, but with the replacement of someone who will continue their draconian policies towards their citizens, which is how they got here in the first place. Also on this week's episode of The Global Lane, the risk of U.S. corporate business dealings with China and a look at how a politically divided America is uniting in prayer for Damar Hamlin. You can see these stories and more on The Global Lane this evening on the CBN News Channel beginning at 8.30 Eastern. You can also download the CBN News app as well as watch it on YouTube. Still ahead, a danger to America from under the sea. Millions of miles of fiber optic cables crisscross the ocean floor. Find out why they're facing potential threats to our national security and what can be done about it when we come back. In September, Europe's Nord Stream gas pipelines were damaged by suspected Russian sabotage. It was a wake-up call for world leaders on a massive security threat. Oil and gas pipelines aren't the only critical infrastructure lying under the sea. The global Internet also runs cables through the ocean floor. And as Caitlin Burke explains, those underwater cables have, have to be protected for America's national security. When you look out over the ocean, you don't often think about what's under the surface. But all over the world, there are millions of miles of fiber optic cables crisscrossing the ocean floor. They're not much larger than a garden hose, but they're responsible for transmitting up to 95% of global internet traffic. Fiber optic cables, uh, cables across the ocean are not new. We've had them since the mid 1800s, different forms, copper. But over the years, as data has become more and more important, as we've become a more digital, globalized world, more and more data uh, flows under the sea. As of 2022, there are approximately 530 active submarine cables running all over the globe. 
In addition to transmitting texts and emails, they also send confidential information like financial transactions and government communications. Without this tech pipeline, the internet wouldn't function, and our digitally driven societies would grind to a halt. Nadia Shadlow, a former U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor, says protecting these cables and their data needs to become more of a priority. Anytime an economy is so dependent on, on um, infrastructure or a particular sector, uh, it becomes strategic, right? It becomes, it becomes a point of vulnerability. <laughs> So our adversaries and competitors recognize this. U.S. adversaries also recognize the cables themselves are incredibly vulnerable. Many people will be aware that the actual fiber optic is about the diameter of a human hair. Um, so there might be a, a couple of dozen fibers inside a cable, but most of the cable is basically to protect uh, the fiber, which is made out of glass, so it's very, very fragile. While direct sabotage could easily result in damage or destruction, Gavin Tully, an engineer and partner at a firm specializing in subsea cables, says this internet infrastructure is also at risk from fishing trawlers or even natural disasters. About 10 months ago, uh, there was a massive volcanic eruption in Tonga, and that uh, eruption created a lot of earthquakes and uh, mudslides that cut all the cables to Tonga. So Tonga was basically without communication for weeks because the ash cloud also blocked the backup satellite. In October, cable damage near the Shetland Islands north of Scotland led to suspicion that an adversary might be trying to make sabotage look like an accident. That's because a Russian research vessel designed to survey the sea floor was reportedly in the area at the time and it wouldn't be the first instance of an enemy severing a country's communications. During World War I, uh, England cut all of Germany's subsea cables, uh, which were telegraph cables at the time, of course, you know, some hundred plus years ago. Russia's war against Ukraine and this summer's Nord Stream pipeline incident served as a wake-up call for many of our allies. France proposed spending more than 3 million euros for ocean floor defense in its 2023 budget. Italy and the UK are also reportedly working to increase surveillance of their underwater cables. And Taiwan is now taking protective measures to ensure communications to the island aren't knocked out by a natural disaster or conflict with China. Here in the U.S., meanwhile, experts are concerned the government isn't doing enough. We need to develop a better public-private um, approach toward understanding when these cables become under, under threat, so to share information more effectively, um, to also probably fund more cable repair ships as well. Most cables running to and from the United States are owned by either telecom carriers or private companies. Over the past few years, it's been predominantly content providers like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon investing in new lines. Shadlow says while the owners are ultimately responsible for security and repairs, the government should be involved as well, given national security interests. CBN News reached out to Google for information on how they protect their cables. A spokesperson responded that the best protection against disruption is having a variety of redundant network paths. That means they're not reliant on one single cable. So the idea is basically creating a global mesh of these types of cables so that if one gets damaged or cut, whether it's on purpose for sabotage or accidental or a natural disaster, it doesn't have significant effect on the global economy. Another vulnerability in our internet infrastructure comes when the data flowing through the undersea cables reaches land. It's at this point where the information is offloaded. The U.S. Office of the Director of National Intelligence classified the possibility of cyber attacks against cable landing stations as a high risk to national security. Finally, countries like China could use state-owned companies to sabotage parts of these undersea networks. Huawei Marine, for example, has built or repaired almost a quarter of the world's cables. Some experts already worry Beijing could have tasked them with spying on the data coming through. We need to be able to provide alternatives to countries and companies uh, that look to Huawei Marine for their components. Similar to the situation with 5G, right? We didn't like Huawei controlling uh, that infrastructure. While conversations are being had in Congress about securing our internet infrastructure, 
National security experts like Shadlow say no significant action has been taken. Still, the information sent through these cables grows more and more sensitive, becoming more enticing to our adversaries and more vital to protect. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Coming up, a biblical site in Jerusalem soon to be open again to the public for the first time in 2,000 years. We're going to bring you that story when we come back. Stay with us. A nearly 3,000-year-old water reservoir where Jesus restored a blind man's sight is being excavated and opening to the public in the coming months. The ancient pool of Siloam served Jerusalem's population during biblical times. And this opening to visitors comes after its rediscovery 18 years ago. It is near the southern part of the city and dates back to the 8th century B.C. and to the reign of King Hezekiah. It once provided water to the inhabitants of the city of David. Well, time now for your Thursday Thankful. I hope you'll join me in this prayer of gratitude. Father, thanks for being my father. I belong to you. It is a joy to call you father and to call you friend. With that prayer, it is my prayer you'll make today a day filled with gratitude from this moment until the day's end. And then you know what? Wake up and repeat that attitude of gratitude. Well, that will do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can always find more of our programs on the CBN News Channel at any time, as well as online at CBNNews.com. We'd love to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can email us, newswatch at CBN.com. You can also reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We certainly would love to hear from you. Hope you'll join us right back here again next time. Goodbye, everybody, and God bless.